The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome. Happy New Year to everyone. It is now officially and unbelievably already 2022. All right, so uh, I don't know. Time just flies, but it's always great to start a new year. Always great to think about what we're going to be doing in the next year. Uh, make New Year's resolutions, come up with... Uh, with new ideas, uh, as I've often said, kind of December is a good time to kind of reevaluate, to think, to plan, uh, to refocus, to energize yourself around life. Of course, you should be doing that all the time. You should always be thinking about how to make your life better. But um, December is a good time. Things just slow down a little bit, particularly the time around Christmas and between Christmas and New Year. Business slow down. The world slows down. Trading on Wall Street slows down, and you just have more time to do that kind of thinking and planning. Although I have to say, this year seemed a little rushed to me. A lot of the things I had planned to do in December, not got, didn't get around to it. But uh, it's okay. It's okay. We'll we'll we'll, we'll keep uh, keep doing the planning over January. All right. I hope everybody had a great New Year's Eve. I, I certainly did. It was a lot of fun. Um, People were uh, firing uh, uh, all kinds of um, uh, fireworks right outside our building, so right, right below our building. So the, the fireworks were really crashing. Literally, the, the sparks were crashing into the windows. It was a little spooky. But on the other hand, we had a perfect view of, some, uh, of a lot of fireworks. Also, from our condo, we can kind of see all along the coast of San Juan, so we could see all the different fireworks, it's small, but all the different fireworks along the coast. There were dozens of them, uh, fireworks shows. So uh, it was uh, it was pretty cool last night. Had dinner with with good friends and celebrated their wedding anniversary. Attended a wedding yesterday. So yesterday was a busy day, uh, and uh, but but all good. So um, welcome to 2022. So today we're going to talk about. I can take these off. We're going to talk about 2022. We're going to talk about um, my, I don't know, uh, predictions, my expectations uh, in terms of uh, the different categories I kind of summed up for 2021 a couple of days ago. So we'll talk about, uh, you know, my expectations for politics, economics, technology, uh, culture, COVID. Uh, but we'll also talk about the Iran Book Show and uh, what... Uh, what I have planned for the Iran Book Show going into 2022, what changes we're going to make, what we're going to keep the same. Um, of course, this is always a work in progress, but, uh, you know, hopefully you guys will get excited uh, by some of this and, um, and uh, we, we, will, uh, we will have a fantastic uh, 2022. Uh, just, uh, again, a thank you to everybody who showed up live uh, for the uh, December 30th show. Uh, it was, uh, from, a, from a, a Super Chat fundraising perspective, December was the best month we have ever had. So uh, we raised more money than we'd ever had uh, before. The, the previous record was actually August of 2020 for some reason. I think that's the beginning when people discovered Super Chat and a lot of whales came in and they just, uh, during August that year, there was just a, a, a lot of excitement about the Super Chat. A lot of money came in. Uh, and uh, But uh, December beat that uh, by, by a, a grand total of $100. But it, that, is, uh, that is fantastic. So um, thank you to everybody who participated in that show, everybody who has contributed Super Chat over December, everybody who has contributed Super Chat dollars throughout uh, 2021. 2021 was the best year for Super Chat by far. Uh, there's Jonathan Honing starting us off today. First first contribution in 20 uh, over Super Chat in uh, 2022 is, uh, is Jonathan. So uh, we're off to the races. Uh, don't forget, we, we are still keeping our goals. Goals haven't changed. Uh, 600 bucks a, uh, a show. Yeah, is a good number. We'll keep it for now. We might raise it at some point, but we'll keep it for now. 
Uh, so thanks, Jonathan, for getting us going. And uh, you know, we'll see if we can make it. I know a lot of you spent your money on the uh, <coughs> in uh, 2020, in December of 2020. But uh, let's see if we can keep it going uh, through January of no December of 2021. Let's see if you can keep it going through January of 2022. I'm going to get these dates right at some point. At some point, we'll get used to 2022. Do you find yourself like signing checks and then who, who writes checks anymore? But, you know, filling in the date wrong, uh, it's, it's always a, um, uh, it, it's always a challenge. Uh, wow. Raphael starts off the super chat with a, like, like a, a, a really deep, difficult question. Uh, we will get to that, Raphael, I promise. Uh, but that's not an easy one to answer quickly. Um, Richard said, should be $750 right now. When you start uh, participating in the Super Chat, maybe we can get to $750. That'll be, that'll be cool. Uh, Cook, Happy New Year. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you again. Brian, thank you. Uh, you guys are all great, and thank you all for contributing to the show. All right. Um, where should we start? Where should we start? Um, it's, it's hard. Uh, there, there's so many different things we can do, so many different... Let's start with COVID just because, God, sick of it. So that, that, is, that is the overall um, uh, basis. We're, we're sick of COVID. Um, I'm sick of COVID. I'm sure you guys are sick of COVID. I'm sick of this being an issue. Uh, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, government needs to get out of our lives, out of here. It, you know, uh, if people... W it, you know, if people, for example, don't want to get vaccinated, want to get sick, let them get sick. If people, uh, if people are going to die as a consequence, them let them die. Get the government out of our lives. Get them off of our backs. Particularly now with Omicron, again, all the information so far shows that uh, COVID is uh, that this version of COVID is pretty weak. Uh, let's get rid of the mandates. Let's get rid of the masks. Let's get rid of the um, vaccine mandates. Uh, you know, let us live, leave us alone. Um, this has always been uh, true. It, this should have always been up to individual choices and uh, company choices and, uh, and, uh, and let companies and individuals make decisions for themselves about how they wanted to deal with this, uh, with this uh, pandemic. Uh, but it's even more true now when the pandemic is mostly pretty weak and where so many of the people are already vaccinated. Uh, that uh, God, what what are they what are they actually afraid of? Well, it's not about fear; it's about control and it's about power, and it's it's very very unusual and it's very very rare for politicians and bureaucrats to let go of power to 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 reduce their uh, involvement in our lives. Usually, what happens, and this is typical of wars, but I think this is probably going to be typical of vaccine. What happens is during a war, government controls increase dramatically. So let's say they go from 10, on a scale of 100, from 10 to 50. After the war, they decline, but they never go back to 10. They go back to 20 or 30. So yes, we will get some of our freedoms back, but the government will stay more powerful, more involved, more in our lives, more engaged, and of course now more emboldened to take control and to define what a crisis is uh, whenever they want, because they got away with it with COVID, they got away with it with the financial crisis, they got away with it over and over and over again. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, COVID is, it's time to just get on with life. It's time to let the scientists and the doctors do their job for vaccines to get better. There's now a, a, a new vaccine application for emergency authorization by, uh, I forget the name of the company, but a new one just submitted. Um, and, and it's gonna, once it's approved, it's gonna have a huge impact, particularly on the third world and outside the United States. It is a, uh, another type of vaccine. It's not mRNA, it's not traditional. It's, uh, I'm not gonna try to remember what it is, but it's a completely different type of vaccine. Uh, and yeah, let bring bring vaccines on, bring them on, let them compete, bring on uh, treatments, uh, bring on a variety of different treatments, whether it's drugs, whether it's just uh, Nov uh, Novavix. Thank you, Novavix is the bring on the pills, 
being on all kinds of different, there is a, there is a, uh, um, uh, an auto vaccine, so a pill form vaccine developed by an Israeli company. Uh, that there were negotiations with uh, some Asian manufacturers about uh, producing and getting authorization for. They're going to be vaccines. They're going to be treatments. They're going to be pills. That's the one thing that's going to happen in 2022 is the variety of ways to deal and handle with COVID are going to increase dramatically. And hopefully uh, that will marginalize all the questionable, marginal, uh, uh, scamish, uh, just false, false, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, treatments and uh, uh, attitudes about uh, about COVID that are being so prevalent. Uh, so you know, this will this will end discussions about ivermectin and so on because there'll be real there'll be real treatments that people can take uh, that are going to be fairly cheap. I think uh, because there's going to be competition, and uh, you know, this is this is going to be this is going to be. Um, you know, quite uh, uh, quite a change, I think, in 2022. We're just going to have a variety of different things, and uh, and and the quacks are going to be are, are going to, uh, you know, it's going to be obvious who the quacks are, who the quacks are. Um, Scott asks a relevant question. Lex Friedman respects Rogan. Is it possible you're misreading Rogan, and he's offering a voice to individual doctors who question the scientific establishment? Yeah, he's offering he's offering. Um, is offering a voice to quacks right now. They are. They, they, they question the scientific establishment. Lots of doctors question the scientific establishment. My mainstream doctor, the doctor who I talk to on a regular basis treating me, questions the scientific establishment. I get all kinds of treatments that often are, are, are not uh, you know, approved and part of the mainstream of the scientific establishment. At the same time, my this doctor, together with 90, I think, 5% of all doctors or more in, in the U.S., that even those who question the scientific establishment about a lot of things, know the science behind the vaccines. Given tens of millions, sorry, hundreds of millions of doses have already been given, uh, given uh, the stats, given the data, given the evidence, given ivermectin and all the studies that have done on ivermectin, the data's in. So Rogan can keep uh, interviewing uh, Rogan can keep interviewing uh, these people, you know, but and they can continue to deny reality. Um, and if you're interested in um, in this Dr. Malone, who uh, who uh, uh, you know who Rogan just interviewed, I mean, Dr. Malone, you know, it's there's a there's a, a long uh, who claims to be the inventor of the mRNA vaccine. Um, there is a long, uh, and this is the guy that Brett Weinstein brought, uh, brought on to show and everything. There is an excellent article that I just tweeted uh, at Nature magazine about the history of mRNA the vaccines, history of mRNA and research in mRNA going back uh, to the 1980s, 70s and 80s. Um, and, and Malone is, is part of that. And, and read that. Read that and then you tell me what you think about Malone. I mean, my, my, uh, my interpretation of the history, now granted, Nature magazine might be biased and might be part of the, uh, what did he call it, the scientific establishment. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, it, maybe they are, maybe they're not, hard to tell. But read the article, uh, and uh, I think what you'll find, my conclusion for the article, granted, it's still... Um, it's still pretty, uh, I, I don't know that much about him, so this is still early. But my conclusion on, on the article is Malone has been, um, has been upset and has been uh, pissed off about not getting full credit for the research he did in the 1980s. He has fought with everybody. He didn't get his PhD from the, uh, uh, from, uh, the University of, uh, of uh, California, San Diego, the Salt Institute there. He didn't get his PhD because of conflict, because he didn't feel like he got enough credit for his uh, research in mRNA. He's a disgruntled, he's been disgruntled for 30 years, 40 years, and now that disgruntled meant, is that a word, um, has found its uh, outlet. Anyway, 
enough enough with uh, with COVID. You guys, I mean, we've talked about this enough. You guys come to their own conclusions. Uh, you do what you want to do. Uh, you know, uh, I think you know where I stand. Uh, so I, I, I think we're going to see a lot of treatments. I think that COVID is going to basically disappear as a medical issue uh, because it will be treatable and, uh, and, and it has evolved to be a, a something weak. And now the question is, is it when are the politicians uh, going to uh, loosen the reins? Uh, I expect that there's going to be significant pressure on them by the spring and by the spring I think a lot of the mandates, a lot of the restrictions, a lot of the travel stuff are going to be loosened up, and uh, and we're going to see a, a beginning of a return to normal. I'm I'm I, I expect and I'm hopeful that by the summer things will be back to normal. Uh, I, it's not clear to me exactly where they will maintain the reins and they will maintain the controls. We will see. Uh, that'll be interesting to watch. We know that's going to happen. Um, by the way, this is exactly what I said uh, last year. So um, uh, take it with whatever, whatever you want to, uh, with whatever grain of salt you want, right? Uh, last year, I also thought that by the summer, all restraints and everything would be passed. But I think Omicron uh, suggests that this is dramatically in decline. The number of people dying from COVID is dramatically in decline, even though cases are through the roof. That is, uh, vaccines are working. Maybe they're not working to prevent you from getting the uh, the virus, but they're certainly working in preventing you from dying from the virus. So I think overall the excuse that uh, the politicians are going to have over the next three months is going to go away as Omicron collapses and uh, hospitalizations go down and as, uh, as, as this virus becomes endemic and becomes a cold, uh, the excuse will go down and then it's a question of how much pressure we want to put on politicians to let us return to normal life. That's my prediction for whatever it's worth, very similar to my prediction last year. So I completely failed on this one last year. Let's hope I'm right on this one this year. Um, another issue that I think is going to be important in 2022, uh, we talked about it with regard to 2021, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens in 2022. Is, um, is, is the whole woke culture. Uh, what's going to happen with woke? Uh, is it going to continue what I think was a decline in the last few months of 2021, uh, a backlash against it, uh, primarily a backlash after November of uh, the November elections in which the, the, the Democrats took a serious beating, in particular in places where they emphasized wokeness, if you will, and uh, uh, where this motivated people to come out and vote against them is, are they going to put it on kind of cold ice, at least until the 2022 midterm elections in order to prevent a massive defeat? Uh, it, can they? Do the can, do, 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 do Democrats even have a control over all the nutcases that are, that are uh, you know, uh, are promoting a lot of this ideology? It's going to be it's going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, is, is critical race theory going to go into decline? Is it going to morph into something different? Are we going to see it become, uh, uh, you know, something else, something, uh, some other form? Remember, critical race theory, nobody had heard of it three years ago. We were talking about intersectionality three, four, five years ago, and then it became critical race theory. What's next? What's next in the sequence of these kind of uh, crazy uh, you know, wokest uh, views. Is wokeism about to die in 2022, at least as a term and as, as, a, as an ideology? Or at least, I don't think it'll die because there are, there, there are significant people in academia and in significant cultural institutions that are going to keep it alive. I think they'll try to call it something different. I think they'll couch it in different terms. I think they're going to try to shift their strategy but the backlash against it, the, the, again, the kind of work that I think Barry Weiss and others have done, it's going to be interesting to see if that is sustainable. I hope so. And whether it has the kind of effects that I hope it has. I, I think the Democrats are, are petrified of what's going to happen in the midterm elections in 2022, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, if they continue on the path they're on. Uh, they're in for a shellacking in 2022 if they, uh, if they don't 
change tactics, right? If they don't change, uh, if they don't change what they're doing. So hopefully we will see a slow decline in the influence of wokeism in our cultural institutions, in the media, in the world out there. What to keep an eye on is what is it going to be replaced with because it won't just disappear. The, the fundamental underlying ideology is not going away, which reminds me, the Ayn Rand Institute is uh, starting, I think this coming Tuesday, a, a multi-month, a, a multi-week um, uh, uh, class on uh, critical race theory, uh, wokeism, uh, uh, intersectionality, a bunch of, all the way back to the post, postmodernism, critical theory, a real intellectual, philosophical deep dive into these ideas, where they come from. Uh, you know, this will be very, um, uh, I was going to say academic, but I mean academic in the positive sense, not in the, in the conventional sense. This will be uh, a deep dive into the ideas that generated this. Uh, it'll be, uh, there'll be a lot of reading assignments. The idea here is to really try to understand, not just to criticize, not just to combat, not just to argue with, but to truly understand where it came from, why it's popular, what ideas it builds on, what phenomena in reality it tries to explain and actually uh, latches onto. So I, I'm, I'm actually going to take this course. I'm going to uh, audit it. I hope, I don't know if I'll do it. I'm going to try to do it live. I'm not sure if I can just timing wise, but I'm going to try to listen to all the, all the classes. I hope you guys consider doing it. If you are, just go to, I think you can go to Ayn Rand Institute University or to, or to Ayn Rand Institute campus and you can sign up and, um, and attend, but I intend to attend it. Hopefully we'll be able to talk about it in, uh, at the, on the own book show. Uh, I really look forward to, to it. It's going to be an actual class, not just again, a bit session, a complaint session, a look how awful the left is, which is what most discussions of wokeism are, this is going to actually be uh, a, a uh, explanation of what it is from its deep roots, going back to the Frankfurt School and all of that, but trying to give it as much credibility as one can. So that's how you understand things. I don't know how much it costs. Um, you'll have to go on the website and find out. Uh, uh, I don't think I'm paying. I should ask if they want me to pay or not. But anyway, I, th I think I think I'm being comped. So, uh, uh, which which is going to be which is going to be uh, which is going to be fun. So, uh, yes, the class on CRT, highly 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 recommended. Uh, on Cog Gate uh, and Nikos, whose last name I can't pronounce, um, uh, who was on the show just recently. Uh, the two of them are going to team teach it. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm super excited about this. So uh, so. Uh, 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 if, if you guys are interested at all, please sign up and, and register for it. All right, let's see. Uh, let's do, yeah, let's do, let's get some politics out of the way. Then we'll go to economics and we'll end with some positives about technology. All right, um, you guys probably consider this a uh, positive. I do, I think. Uh, 22, 22, 2022 midterms. Uh, I think everybody is pretty much on the same page here. I think everybody's expecting a major Republican uh, win here. Republicans would really have to screw up um, not to have this win uh, b because Democrats have proved to be so pathetic and, and so incompetent. Uh, Biden would have to have a phenomenal year. His approval rating would have to go up significantly and dramatically uh, for, for this to change. There's no reason to believe that will happen. Uh, the only time things like that happens in dramatic ways are like wars and stuff like that. I, I'm not expecting a war. Uh, you never know. Uh, you know, you could launch a war just to get your approval ratings up, but that would be tough in the environment we live in today, which is so divisive. I don't think you could rally the country around a war unless it was clearly instigated by some something like a, an attack on the United States. I don't expect it. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Biden is going to continue to be incompetent for, for the rest of 2022. Uh, I, I think the administration is going to flounder. I, I, I think we're going to have economic problems. We'll get to that. Uh, given the economic problems, it's very likely that the opposition party wins significantly. Um, I think there's going to be a war. There might be a war in Ukraine. I don't think the U.S. will intervene. Um, but 
so I expect the Republicans to win uh, significantly in the House in 2022, and they might take the Senate. You'd expect them to take the Senate in 2022. They should pick up a seat in Georgia. Um, if, if Trump stays out of it, we'll see. Uh, and uh, they should pick up a few other seats. As we get closer to the midterms, we'll, we can analyze that a little bit and see. I'm not a political analyst. I'm not an expert in these things. But if Republicans will win, which will basically make uh, give a stalemate um, in uh, Congress, uh, give us a Republican House, Senate, House or Senate, give us a Democratic president. That combination usually bodes well for the world uh, in terms of nothing gets done. I'm, I'm pretty happy um, when nothing gets done in Washington, D.C. Until, until, uh, until we, we turn a corner, until there's some decent people in D.C., until there's there, there are people who there's a, some sense of, of, of the role of government in D.C., uh, I, my preference, my preferred preference generally, oh, there's Troy. Hey, Troy. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, Happy New Year. And uh, uh, thank you for all the support you showed this year. Uh, uh, Troy has been uh, one of uh, the, the most substantial supporters of the Yuan Book Show over the last year, both as a monthly contributor and as somebody who shows up every few weeks and just drops, in this case, 500 Australian dollars. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic. In particular, Troy... Uh, was the one who got me to do a series in 2020 on uh, the virtues, uh, which I thought was was terrific, and hopefully you guys enjoyed, and hopefully some of you have gone back to listen to. I think I've I think I've got it in a uh, playlist, uh, and that ultimately I think inspired uh, the uh, Iran Rules for Life, uh, which by the way I am looking for a sponsor for the whole year for the Iran Rules for Life show. I'll talk about that later when we talk about the plans for. Yuan Book Show for uh, 2022. Uh, I do want to do Yuan Rules for Life on a regular basis. I do want to be asking less for money during shows. So uh, uh, to, to make that happen, sponsorship would be ideal. Uh, somebody sponsoring one, one Yuan Rules for Life a month or, or two a month uh, for the whole of 2022 would solve a lot of that problem and would make it a lot easier. Anyway, um, thank you, Troy. I appreciate it. Uh, copy paste Joss's question. Um, so uh, where were we? Uh, so politics, yes, we get stalemate. Uh, you know me, I'm happy with stalemate. I'm particularly happy with stalemate when you have a Democratic president, a Republican House and Senate. Those are the best stalemates ever. Um, uh, you know, much, much better, uh, much, much better than um, the kind of uh, the opposite stalemate, uh, Republican president, Democratic House and Senate because the Republicans always compromise with the left, and therefore it always shifts to the left, whereas the Democrat usually compromises with the Republicans, which shifts everything uh, to, from an economic perspective, to a better place, to, uh, to more freedom, smaller government, uh, more broadly. That happened with Clinton, um, and that certainly happened, uh, it also happened with um, Obama, and I think, I think it would actually happen with Biden. Uh, Biden would, 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 would move towards Republicans in a significant way in order to try to, to bolster his chances of getting reelected in 2024. So my prediction for the midterms is uh, Republicans win uh, in, in significant ways. Um, but I think even more important than the midterms, in some sense, are going to be the Republican primaries all over the country leading up to the 2022 midterms. Republican primaries for Senate candidates, Republican primaries for House candidates, Republican primaries for governors, Republican primaries for election officials. And here the fundamental question that will shape the Republican Party and determine, I think, the long-term direction the Republican Party can take, will take, is whether Trump's candidates win or lose, whether they win big or win just a little bit. Whether he sweeps, including election officials, which will bode really, really, really badly for the fairness of the 2024 elections, or whether, you know, maybe he wins some, loses some, or whether he loses all. I'm certainly hoping, if I, was a, if I, if, if I thought prayer would work, 
I would pray that he, he loses every single uh, uh, person he has, uh, he has endorsed uh, loses, but that probably won't happen. But, but if a significant number of them lose, to me, that's more important than the 2022 uh, midterms. Uh, so um, I, 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 you know, my hope is that uh, the Republican Party will decide to shift directions away from Trump uh, during 2022, and that means during the 2022 primaries. Because if Trump wins big in 2022 primaries, he is the nominee in 2024. There's just no way to avoid that. No way to, no way to avoid that. Um, as I said, I think Biden continues to be incompetent. Nothing new here. I don't see anything different. I, I, I think, uh, uh, you, you know, there's, uh, there's no reason to expect him to get any better at what he's doing. Even by his own standards, uh, he, he, is, uh, he is awful. Uh, Peter Thiel is supporting some really awful people. So, uh, no, I, I hope the candidates that Peter Thiel supports lose big time, not a little bit. I hope they get slammed, uh, both Blake Masters in Arizona, who I know, who I've met, and uh, J.D. Vance are both horrible. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I used to like Masters, but uh, he's become awful. So... I think both of them represent the worst of the Republican Party. I think they both represent this move towards nationalism and towards uh, uh, big government uh, conservatives and towards uh, Trumpism and populism, and I hope they get crushed in the primaries. I, I'm not predicting anything because I don't know, but I hope they get crushed. Um, so that, that uh, to everything Trump gets crushed, and... Um, and I hope, that, uh, I hope that all his candidates, including the Peter Thiel candidates, even though they're going to get a huge amount of money, uh, I hope they get, uh, they get crushed completely. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter. The U.S. Senate doesn't matter because even if you get rid of the filibuster, it, it, it won't matter because the fact is that the, Re the Republicans are going to take the House no matter what. And if Republicans take the House, the Democrats are not going to give up on the filibuster. They're not going to vote away the filibuster because... They won't have control of the House. They won't have any legislation to pass. So the Senate becomes less important. What's primarily important is, uh, is the House. If Republicans take it, the Senate becomes irrelevant. The Senate becomes irrelevant. Um, I think they'll take the Senate as well. But much more important than the House and Senate is the Republican primaries. Sorry, I think the fate of the country, the fate of the country depends on whether Republicans uh, back Trump or not. And the fact that people like Ken here and others, in spite of everything they've seen from Trump over the last year, are still blindly supportive of him, are still mindlessly supporting anything that Trump touches and anything that Trump does, just proves to me how bad of an influence he is and how destructive he is uh, to this country and to the Republican Party. I mean, you'd think that somebody who, who supported Trump and always said, oh, you know, I don't like Trump, but I like his policies, da, 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 would have moved on to a candidate that was better than Trump, but represented similar ideas to Trump. I don't know, uh, uh, like the governor of, of Florida. But no, they, 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 they are loyal to the man, not to ideas, not to a point of view, but to the man. And that trend in American politics is super dangerous. And, uh, and let's hope it gets defeated and crushed in 2022. All right, uh, just a few, um, uh, a few other issues. Legislation, um, Build Back Better, I think, is dead. Maybe they'll come back with some small version of it. But I think nobody's incentivized to actually get Build Back Better done. The other big legislative push might be on big tech, where there might be uh, agreement between Democrats and Republicans. I've always said when Democrats and Republicans get together, when they agree on something, run for the hills. Um, luckily, I think they don't agree enough to actually get legislation passed. So I'd be surprised if they can actually get antitrust and anti-big tech new legislation passed. I hope they cannot. Um, I, you know, this, this would be a disaster if they get it. This is where I love gridlock where I love the fact that they can't agree on anything. I hope there are enough Republicans who still don't like antitrust, who still don't like government involvement, even in big tech, that are going to resist attempts by the Democrats and by some Republicans to pass legislation. 
uh, in the Senate over Republican needs of 41 votes in order to stop this. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get 41 votes, but I hope he gets 41 votes. Um, it, it's, it's uh, you know. <laughs> Cook says, people who will support, still support Trump need to read their hypothesis. I'm sorry, Cook, but... Um, it, you know, it depends what you mean by support Trump, but, but, but people who are still raving over Trump, falling over themselves over Trump, people who still think that Trump is God's gift to, human, to, 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 to America, uh, reading them is not going to help them. You know, not, if, if in 2022 uh, they are still blind followers of, of Trump, as, as, as many of them have been, uh, this is not going to help them. All right. Um, let's see. Where are we? Um, so, yeah, antitrust, anti-big tech going to be a big story this year. The Democrats have a big package of bills to regulate big tech that has passed the House um, or has passed committee in the House. It hasn't been voted on in the House. It's a complicated bill. So who knows if it can pass anything? Who knows if it can pass uh, the, uh, the Senate? Uh, we will see. We will see. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it, but it's going to be a big issue. It's going to be something to watch. So I don't expect big legislation coming out of this year, partially because the Senate is 50-50. And with 50-50 Senate, you can't get a lot done. You just can't get a lot done. And, and particularly with Manchin and everything, the Democrats are just not going to be able to get much of their agenda passed. I, I wish Republicans controlled the Senate. I wish it was 51-49. Um, I, I blame the inability of the Republicans to win that last Senate seat, the two Senate seats in Georgia, uh, squarely, fully, on Donald Trump. But it is what it is. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm you know, 50-50 is better, I guess, than the Democrats controlling it. But it's, uh, it's, it's enough, I hope, to stop... Um, to stop Democrats from getting their agenda passed. Uh, all right, finally, on American politics, the big issue this year, uh, maybe the biggest, one of the biggest political issues this year is going to be uh, Supreme Court uh, decisions. And uh, uh, I'll just answer this. Last time, I'll answer Ken. Uh, yes, as far as I know, Peacock did vote for Trump. Is Peacock a blind follower of Trump's? No. Not everybody who voted for Trump is a blind follower. Some people are blind followers of Trump. I, I would argue you might be one, but uh, some people are. I, you, know, you can vote for Trump without being a blind follower of Trump. Um, all right, where was I? Supreme Court. I think the biggest issue with the Supreme Court is going to be abortion. I think this is the year where we've got a really, really good chance that uh, Roe versus Wade is overturned. I think this would be a, a, a tragedy. Uh, I, I think we will, you know, I think we will pay for this for a long, long time. But I, I expect that uh, e either Roe versus Wade is overturned or Roe versus Wade uh, is significantly weakened. And uh, if Roe versus Wade is significantly weakened, then where you live in the United States is going to matter uh, much more than it has in the past, particularly if you're uh, female and young. Uh, it, 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 it's going to be incredibly interesting. I do expect the Texas abortion law to be voted down. I think that'll be a hugely important decision, as I said the other day. Uh, but I do expect it to go down. But I also expect the Missouri law to be upheld and uh, therefore to Roe versus Wade to be weakened and maybe overturned. Uh, we'll see. I'm not sure if the Supreme Court is quite ready to overturn Roe versus Wade, but I think they are, they are uh, very, very close uh, to doing it. Um, just, just to, uh, all right, let's see, uh, let's see. So those are kind of domestic political issues. Happy to answer any, uh, super chat questions you might have on other domestic issues. Um, that would be cool. I've got one other, let's see, I've got one other international one, and then we'll turn to economics and tech. I will say that we're um, at about 450, so about 150 short of the $600 goal for today. So uh, 
Happy to get $20 Super Chat questions. We got a lot of Super Chat questions, but they're all in the, uh, except for one, they're all in the $5 to $15 range. So what we need is six $20 questions so we can get, uh, we can get beyond that. Um, all right. Um, you know, if, 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 you guys are, uh, if you guys are in the uh, Lena Pickoff camp, uh, I, I think, then you wouldn't uh, come on my stream, Ken, and you wouldn't say, go Trump, and at every critique of mine of Trump, come back and challenge it. You would say, yeah, Trump sucks, but if Trump is the Republican nominee, I'd rather have him than a Democrat. Fine, I would even, I would accept that if you accepted all my criticisms of him, if you accepted everything, everything that's objectively true about Trump. So uh, you could tactically vote. I tactically vote all the time. Uh, there are no candidates who represent my point of view. I constantly tactically vote or tactically recommend voting since I don't vote anymore. Uh, but you, you uh, present yourself as if, right? You present yourself as if uh, you are a blind Trump follower because anytime I criticize Trump, you come in and defend him. That's not... It's not objective, you know, and I, again, I don't want to speak for Peacock, uh, so I'll just say that's not objective. Uh, you can say I vote for Trump because I, I think overall that's the best alternative. That's not the same. That's not the same. All right, let's see. Uh, <laughs> so one international one, uh, this is one I've I talked about already, so I'm not going to say too much about it. I talked about in the run in the, in the review in the uh, thing about uh, 2021, um, the 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 summary of 2021. I do think um, uh, China is going to be a big story. I, I think economic slowdown in China is going to be a big story. I think Ch China clamping down internally is going to be a big story. I think generally, uh, you know, China becoming less powerful but more assertive is going to be the big story. And um, uh, China's going to have significant weakness. China's behind the curve on COVID. Uh, as, I, as, as we've talked about uh, uh, Xi'an, this uh, 13 million people uh, city in China, massive city in China, uh, uh, historical capital of, of the Chinese emperors, uh, is in lockdown, still in lockdown. Now, that, uh, that kind of putting cities like that in lockdown over long periods of time has massive consequences economically, culturally, psychologically, uh, politically. So I think China is in decline. Uh, I think Russia gets more aggressive. It pushes. Uh, I don't know if it goes to the war in Ukraine, but it pushes. It, it becomes more, you know, maybe they start a, a like a hot war without really invading, maybe more uh, exchanges, uh, I don't think they're going to invade in the winter. I've said this before. Uh, I think the fear of invading in the winter is they get bogged down in the spring. Uh, I think if there's going to be an invasion of Ukraine, it will happen uh, in the summer once uh, once the uh, the the ground dries up from all the all the melted ice in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, somebody told me uh, winter is a good time to invade uh, because everything's frozen and you can move. But at some point it melts, and uh, unless you're very quick, unless you can take control over that country in three months, uh, if you fear that it's going to be slow, you wait till the summer. So we will see. Uh, we will see what happens. I, I don't expect war because I don't think Putin actually wants war. I think Putin just wants to flex muscles. I, I think Putin ultimately wants to impact uh, Ukrainian elections so that Ukraine ultimately becomes like Belarus. Belarus is now basically a satellite of Russia without firing a shot, right? And uh, what Putin would like is for an internal coup to happen inside Ukraine to generate exactly the same outcome, whether it's done democratically or not democratically. He wants somebody to be running uh, Ukraine that is a crony of his. And I think that's more likely than anything than an invasion. I think, look, war is very expensive. Russia, while right now, uh, you know, a lot of money coming in because uh, because of oil and natural gas, uh, Russia is not a rich country. Russia is a economically struggling country. Uh, people are poor in Russia generally, 
and uh, war I don't think is ultimately good for Putin. Uh, think about the fact that the Soviet Union, you could argue about the causes of the collapse, but certainly one of the things, one of the causes was exhaustion from the war in Afghanistan and, and the fact that they couldn't afford it and there were just people just getting killed for no reason. And so anyway, my, my argument is Putin doesn't want a war, he can't afford a war. Um, yep, it, 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 it's easy to say that things I, you disagree with uh, are dogmatic beliefs of mine. <laughs> That's a great way to, to, to blow them over. I make arguments about my beliefs. I've made arguments about Trump for six years now, six years, since 2016. Uh, when I did show after show about show about why Trump was so awful. Uh, so I've, I've got a record of many, many tens and, uh, of hours of, uh, of rhetoric about Trump. Um, you can call it dogma. You can call it uh, confirmation bias. You can call it whatever you want. But uh, until I hear arguments against the actual things I've said, and shown that I've been wrong, and the things I predicted Trump would do that he didn't do, things I predicted Trump did, things that Trump did that I thought would have negative results, and they did, until you start taking stuff that I said and showing me I was wrong. Um, I think it's, uh, again, lazy thinking, calling what I'm saying dogmatic, and calling my, what I say as confirmation bias, confront the issues, present your views. You've got the super chat here. You can put it in for $2. Present, uh, present me with facts that would lead me to change my mind about Trump. I haven't been sick to my stomach over Trump. I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the happiest people I know, so in spite of Trump. So <laughs> I hate Trump because I think he is, uh, he is a, a unmitigated disaster for America, and I love America. That's, I, I, why is this so hard for you guys to understand? I, I, I find it, I find it interesting, anyway, enough. Um, would there be, in other words, there'll be plenty of time to talk about this uh, as, um, as we move into uh, 2024. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about this. So, uh, you know, bring it on, guys. All the, you know, it's surprising how many of you are still around because most of the people who support Trump have left, have gone, have unsubscribed to this channel and, and certainly don't appear here, uh, don't appear here uh, uh, on the live chat anymore. So, uh, but there's still many of you here. <laughs> but... Uh, I, it's shocking to me. It really is. It surprises me. Um, it surprises me, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised anymore. It is. A year after he left office, it is a year after uh, January 6th, it is shocking to me how, peop how many people are still interested in Donald Trump. It's just, I thought after January 6th, he was done. And now. Um, all right. And, and uh, you know, when, uh, yeah, we'll talk about this uh, when I talk about the Iran Book Show and my expectations for next year. But one of the things that I've just recognized is, um, you, know, uh, my, I, you know, I've always, well, I'll talk about this in, uh, later, right? <laughs> All right, economics. Uh, a big issue is going to be over the next year is inflation, uh, whether inflation increases, how much it increases, to what impact this has, of course, on the dollar. Um, uh, inflation is um, in, in inflation is a huge. Um, people underestimate the extent to which inflation disrupts an economy, disrupts people's mood, um, disrupts production, disrupts success. Uh, people forget how dark the 1970s were in terms of America's mood, Americans' attitudes, uh, in terms of economic progress. And, and a lot of that has to do with inflation. Inflation creates this massive uncertainty that just sits over your head. You don't know what things are going to cost tomorrow. You don't know how much you're going to earn tomorrow. You don't know as a businessman how much to invest. 
You don't know what interest rates are going to be. You, it, it's just inflation is much, much worse. I mean, what I've seen over the last year is as inflation has increased significantly in the U.S., people have just gone, yeah, nobody cares. Right? Nobody cares. Inflation is a, 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 a unmitigated disaster. And if it stays high like it is today and if it gets higher than it is today, we're going to see some real negative consequences. And I expect that that is going to happen. And I wouldn't be surprised that if in 2022 or maybe it's in 2023 or maybe 2024, but in the next three years, we actually get stagflation uh, because the Biden administration is a high regulation administration are going to uh, engage in more regulations and more controls as we get more inflation, you're going to get both stagnation and inflation at the same time. And that is the worst of all worlds. That is the worst of all worlds. And it's, it's going to be, it's going to be again, a, uh, a, an unmitigated, I think, uh, disaster for this country. Um, and again, it, it'll bolster the, the success of Republicans in 2024. It'll make the Republican candidate, in, uh, sorry, bolster the success of Republicans in 2022. And it will make uh, the Republican candidate, whoever he is in 2024, the, uh, the favorite to win uh, the presidency in 2024. And as a consequence, this is why it's so important that the Republicans choose somebody other than uh, Donald Trump, because I think whoever is the Republican candidate wins in 2024. And of course, my ho hope with getting Biden elected, and this is the strategic investing perspective that you might not agree with, but this is my strategic investment perspective, um, election, electing perspective, was that uh, Biden would be such a failure, the left would be such a failure, Republicans will be it, it will have had enough of Donald Trump that they will actually find somebody better, uh, and that the Republican Party will win in 2024 on a much better platform with a much better candidate. Whether that turns out to be right or not is completely up in the air. But that was what I said. It was the reason I was so anti-Trump going into the 2020 election. For those of you who remember, and again, all, everything I've ever said is on record. You can go and challenge it. You can bring it up. You can find clips and you can challenge me on them if you so desire. All right. So uh, stagflation, increased regulations, business slowdown, uh, bad economic times, I think, in our future. I just don't see economically uh, where things go. Um, one of the things to watch for is going to be really interesting is this phenomenon of the Great Resignation. Will it continue into 2022? How big is it? Uh, one of the things that I didn't talk about in 2021 was the Great Resignation has also resulted in one of the largest increases in new business formation in American history. So we're seeing a lot of new businesses, a lot of entrepreneurship. So maybe this Great Resignation is ultimately a positive. Maybe this Great Resignation is people giving up jobs uh, with, uh, that are less interesting and less fun and less lucrative and less innovative and less productive and replacing them with entrepreneurial activity that is much more beneficial economically and much more beneficial to themselves. Uh, this seems to have been a trend in the late uh, latter part of 2021. I hope it continues into 2022. Lots of new business formations, whether it's restaurants all the way to new high-tech biotech startups. And uh, I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, it, you know, it's going to be exciting to, uh, to see the, uh, the, these new businesses and, and what they can achieve and what they can do. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to see how this great resignation follows. Uh, we are in the midst of a massive labor shortage. This is going to um, uh, be part of the, uh, the stagnation, I think, is the fact that we've got a labor shortage. The solution to labor shortages is to increase immigration. Of course, that won't happen. Uh, it won't happen under Biden, uh, and it won't happen under a Republican president. And as a consequence, we will just have to suffer through the fact that there is a shortage of labor. And as a core consequence of the shortage of labor, uh, we are going to see slower economic growth and, and, and massive uh, challenges uh, from an economic perspective. So, uh, 
again, things to watch out for 2022. Okay, uh, last thing I'm going to make just generally about the world out there is that I am one thing I'm excited about 2022, really excited about 2022 uh, in terms of watching, in terms of seeing, and that is innovation. Uh, I, you know, innovation more broadly, I think the crypto blockchain world uh, is maturing. I think we're going to see some interesting applications of blockchain, interesting applications of, of uh, crypto, of coins, of, of different things. We'll see. I'm hopeful of that. Um, I, you know, just generally, I think we're going to see some significant innovations in the Internet space. I think we're going to see some alternatives to the mainstream social media platforms. I don't know if you saw this, but Alex Epstein and God, his name just slipped my mind. I can see his face. His name just slipped my mind. Have just launched a new social media platform called Thoughtful. Look it up. Uh, subscribe to it. Get on Thoughtful. Uh, I, I, I think uh, social media is ripe for disruption, and I think Thoughtful could be one of the ways it is disrupted. Let's hope. Uh, it'd be great if, uh, if uh, Alex Epstein is, uh, is one of our new billionaires, um, uh, tech billionaires uh, in, in, in 10 years or maybe in two years. Who knows? So uh, check out Thoughtful and, and go sign up for it. Um, and uh, so that is super exciting. Uh, that, and I think there's going to be a lot more. The, the cost, Brian, Brian uh, Armitage, thank you, Ian. God, I can't believe I forgot. Brian, if you're listening to this, I, 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 uh, I apologize. So it's Brian Armitage uh, have launched. Brian is a, uh, uh, is a former Facebook employee, former senior Facebook employee, somebody who left Facebook over the fact that Facebook was so overwhelmingly, dominantly left and was becoming so intolerant of alternative voices. Uh, Brian is an objectivist. So Brian and, and, uh, and Alex have formed this company and uh, they just launched their first product, uh, Thoughtful. It's a new type of social media platform. Let's hope it takes off. I am here going to promote it as much as I can. So you guys go use it, please. Download it, check it out. I mean, don't use it if you don't like it, but at least test it out. This is one way in which you can help make the culture a better place. Is that take a product like this that was created by objectivists who really put a lot of thought into what would be a good social media platform? What would it look like? And then this is one way in which you can help change the world, in which you can immediately have an impact out there in the world by making it, by using it, by promoting it, by helping making it viral. Okay. So... Go, guys. Thoughtful. I downloaded the app. I haven't had a chance to play around with it too much. I, you know, it's hard for me to do new social media. I've got so many, but I'm going to. I'm going to get engaged with it um, and, uh, and hope you guys start getting engaged with it as well. It's called Thoughtful. Thoughtful. Uh, and I'll keep, I'll keep promoting it through 2022. So this is, this is one of my big goals. I might, have, I might ask Brian to come on the show and talk about it. Maybe Brian and Alex, or just Brian, or just Alex. We'll see. It would be good to have Brian on the show. Brian is very, very smart, very thoughtful, uh, good guy. It'll be good to have him on the show to talk about uh, talk about this. All right. But the area of tech, which I'm most excited about for the for next year, and I'd say for the next ten years, the area I'm most excited about for the next ten years is is biotech, more broadly biotech. I think mRNA technology is, is amazing. What, the, what, the, uh, what these vaccines have done is fantastic. And I think uh, they're going to launch us into a new era. Uh, there's already significant work being done in mRNA vaccines for yellow fever, for Zika, for HIV. And of course, the ultimate will be uh, 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 the potential for vaccine for cancer. Uh, so mRNA treatments for cancer. Uh, mRNA is, is, a, is a magnificent technology that basically uses your own cells to manufacture, to manufacture proteins, to manufacture stuff, to manufacture spike proteins in the case of, of the vaccines, to combat fill in the blank. It's a platform. It can be designed to do lots of different things. This is why the attacks in the mRNA vaccines, uh, uh, you know, because they're false, are so horrible because this te technology 
has this unbelievable potential in terms of what it can do and how successful it can be and I think will be. I think we're going to see massive breakthroughs here. I, I mean, the only thing that's going to slow us down is uh, FDA. FDA kind of sped up the process, still too slow, sped up the process because of COVID. Let's hope that they keep a speedy process for all these others. But it's more than that. You know, in, uh, in 2021, we already saw a malaria vaccine. Now, a malaria vaccine has the potential to save over 1 million lives a year. About 1 million people die a year from malaria. That's 1 million people. It's a, it's a, it's a massive number. Now, it's not people you know. I know. Because people you know don't buy, die of malaria. But it's human lives. It's human beings that could be productive. It's human beings that can add to the values that we have in this world. I'm a lover of human beings. And, and, and if there's a technology out there, like a malaria vaccine, that's terrific. That's already been launched. There'll be more malaria vaccines. Some of them are based on mRNA technology. Uh, this one was not an mRNA vaccine. It was a different type of vaccine, but wow. I mean, we've been looking for a vaccine for malaria for decades. But, it's, but mRNA is not even the most exciting technology. The most exciting technology, which is CRISPR. It's gene editing. It's the ability to go in and change our genes. Go in and change your genes right now so that if you have a disease, if you have something that is caused by the genes in your body right now, they can go and clip them out and replace them with other genes. Literally go into your DNA right now. Or what people call designer babies and, and literally change the genes of an embryo and take out the genes that cause certain diseases. It's truly stunning. It's truly stunning. So I think CRISPR is a game changer in human history. It is going to lead to dramatic shifts in human society. It's going to allow us to do things that we, could only, we couldn't even imagine unless we were science fiction writers. It is going to change the entire dynamic of biology in the future, including life extension and all the disease prevention, disease fighting. Uh, you know, we can eradicate whole diseases at the gene level before they ever impact us. Think of Hutchinson disease and, and uh, uh, oh God, uh, you know, the cancers that are genetic, like breast cancer, which is uh, heavily genetic. Think of Alzheimer's, which is genetic. If you could go in and, and change those genes, uh, you could even uh, eliminate HIV genetically. By the way, that has been done in China, uh, where, where, where uh, 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 children um, with a in vitro were placed, uh, went in and uh, changed the genes that produce, uh, I can't remember, a protein that makes HIV possible. Anyway, they prevented these kids from having HIV, which otherwise they would have inherited from their father who had HIV, which is just unbelievable. Now, bad people can use this for bad things. True, just like nuclear weapons, just like everything else. But the upside is so dramatic that I, I just hope they allow this work, that it flourishes, that it advances, that venture capital invests in it. I think it is. I, I, I think the upside is magnificent. As you know, I think I mentioned on the show this year, I read uh, a, a biography of uh, Dowden, who is the, uh, she is the, uh, one of the uh, scientists who won a Nobel Prize for uh, CRISPR. Uh, you know, she is fantastic, uh, and, and I highly recommend the book. It's by the same guy who wrote, and I forget his name now, who wrote the biography of Steve Jobs and the biography of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. It's very well written. It's an excellent book. And, uh, and if you want to just get a glimpse of uh, gene technology and what's possible, I highly recommend this book. Uh, it, and it's, uh, it's, it's truly mind-blowing technology. So, um, you know, go buy the book and, and read it. All right. 
Um, those are my predictions for 2022 or my thoughts about 2022 more than predictions. Uh, you can then at the end of the year uh, play this back to me and uh, challenge me about what I got wrong and what I got right. Let's hope all the bad stuff I predicted I got wrong and all the good stuff I predicted I got right. That would be good. I, I, I'm happy to be wrong about certain things. Walter Isaacson, thank you. Walter Isaacson is the author. I think it is called The Code Breakers, Code Breakers, and it's, it's excellent. So uh, uh, I highly recommend it. I also highly recommend Walter Isaacson's book on Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which was brilliant. And um, uh, Doudna uh, was, is, is, is an amazing, she is an amazing scientist, an amazing scientist, and sounds like an amazing human being. So definitely worth the read. All right, before we get to the Super Chat, and we have reached our goal of $600, so thank you for starting off the year perfectly, in, with, in, in, in perfect form, reaching uh, $600.89. So uh, we're over the threshold. Anything, anything uh, now would be gravy, um, and that would be, uh, that would be terrific. But, um, but I've got a lot of Super Chat questions. So, uh, so there's no shortage of questions for me to get to once I do one more 2022 plans predictions. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, this show, what we're going to do for 2022. Um, and uh, so I want to share with you kind of my plans. Nothing revolutionary, nothing big. We've got the new lens. So I think people like this new look. Um, uh, uh, I've got a lot of compliments about it. I like it. It, it solves this problem of me being way too close to the screen. Uh, so this is a lot, this is a lot, uh, this is a lot better. Um, but a few things I, I, I want to try to commit to you and we'll see if I stick to and we'll see if we can pull this off. Uh, but uh, I want to, I want to be in a position where I have to ask you during the show for less for money. I know some people are really turned off by it. I think I lose some subscribers because of it or at least supporters because of it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, you know, mention at the beginning of the show, mention at the end of the show. When we get into answering the Super Chat questions, I'll, I'll talk about it then. But during the actual content, I'll try to keep the content clean of commenting on what is going on with the Super Chat. I, I even today meant to do that and got sucked into commenting on it too early. Um, so uh, I, I, will definitely, I will definitely try to be more disciplined about um, not getting too sucked into the chat and not getting too sucked into the, particularly into the issue of how much money we're raising at any given point in time. Even though the, the, the fact is, Happy New Year, Tzvika, uh, even though the fact is that uh, when I do ask you guys and when I do make a big deal during the show about it, you come through. So that's the problem is, you know, you guys create the temptation. <laughs> not a problem. It is a good thing that you guys come through. Um, so, uh, uh, so I'm going to try to f find ways to ask for less money, do it in the beginning, do it in the end. But part of this, part of asking for less money during the show uh, is I want to, I want to, uh, something in exchange for you and from you in a sense, in exchange for me asking for less money. So making this smoother. And this is particularly for those of you who are listening by podcast or listening to the show after the fact or not live is, uh, I, you know, what we need is a boost to, um, you know, to the uh, to sponsorships and to monthly contributions. So the more monthly contributions I get, and and you know, as I've said, and, and it hasn't happened yet, but I'm hoping it will during 2022. What we need is about a 50% increase in uh, monthly contributions. So from where we are today, uh, times 1.5, at least 1.5 to doubling. Uh, so if you already contribute monthly. Um, if you increase by 50% or if you increase by 25%, if you increase something, that would be fantastic, uh, right? That would, that would go a long way to getting us there. Uh, but most of it, it has to come from people who don't yet contribute, whether it's existing subscribers, existing listeners, because I know, you know, every one of these shows is listened to by about 4,000 different people. Uh, 2,000 in YouTube, 2,000 my podcast. Some of the shows, it can go up to six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 people, Right. So if, if just, a, if just uh, more of those people uh, become monthly supporters of the show, that will be fantastic. And, uh, and that will reduce kind of the pressure on 
Super Chat, I, I still would like Super Chat. I like the interaction. I like getting the questions and everything. But, that, but, but if we could increase that by 50 to 100%, that would, uh, you know, I live off of this. As I said, this is my salary. So that will give me the kind of salary, if you will, that I need uh, in order to, 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 uh, to live my life. Right? So uh, more monthly supporters. And, 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 and more from the monthly supporters I have who can afford to do it. Uh, Noel, thank you. 50 Canadian dollars. That's very generous. Really appreciated that. He says, here's more gravy. Couldn't be here on Thursday. I, I appreciate the support now. That's great. Um, I know there is, so uh, that, is, uh, that is good. Um, so become a, uh, become a monthly supporter. Uh, YouTube has a member feature. Um, we're still trying to figure out how to make that, how to work that into the variety of different ways you can support the show. It's not my preferred, uh, it's got a few limitations that, uh, that don't make it ideal. Uh, Action Jackson is looking into it, so uh, we continue to kind of scan uh, the potential. Finally, on, on the money front, this will be the last thing on the money front, uh, sponsorships is a great way to support the show and to kind of move us in a, in a direction that you would like to go. So, for example, I know a lot of you love uh, the, um, the uh, Iran Rules for Life. Now, Iran's Rules for Life don't do well in terms of bringing in subscribers. They don't do well in terms of sheer viewership. Uh, they do okay financially in the Super Chat. But... I like the Iran Rules for Life. I think they're important to do. I'm going to do them, but what would make it exciting and what would make it motivating and would guarantee that we get them is if we basically had a sponsor for all of them. For the second part of 2021, I had a, a sponsor for all the Iran Rules for, for Life, an anonymous sponsor. You can be anonymous, you can be non-anonymous. Uh, you know, basically paid for all the Iran's rules for life in the second half of 2021. Uh, for 2022, it'd be great if we had somebody who was willing to do that for the next 12 months, whether it's one show a month or whether it's two shows a month. So if you're interested in be, uh, being a sponsor for that, uh, let me know. Uh, you know, send me an email, uh, write to me on PayPal or just make a contribution on PayPal. Uh, if you want to organize a kind of little fundraising campaign on PayPal to, to, to raise the money to do more Iran Rules for Life shows, then uh, feel free to do that. But uh, what we need is a thousand bucks a show um, uh, for sponsorships. So twelve thousand for twelve shows, twenty four thousand for uh, uh, twenty four shows. Pretty simple math. So um, as I said, looking for a sponsor for that, uh, you could do it. A thousand a month uh, for the next twelve months. That would be perfect. All right. Enough about that. Uh, more stuff on the show. So I look back at twenty twenty one in terms of subscribers, and it's really interesting. It, it, you know, by the way, I might not get to all the super chat questions today, just because there's so many of them, um, and I'm going much longer than I expected. But anyway. I want to finish this segment, and then I'll do as many Super Chat as I can, but I do have to go to dinner at some point, so, so we'll see how we go. Um, look back, and one of the, one of the interesting phenomena, particularly in the last couple of months, was uh, the dramatic decline in subscribers and the increase in people who unsubscribed to the Iran Brook Show. Um, now, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, I, I know what to make of it, but... I don't view that necessarily as a bad thing. It just is what it is. It's a, it's a reality. Uh, I can link every uh, wave of unsubscribers to a particular issue, and that is fine. Net, we've always increased every month, has seen an increase in subscribers. But uh, November, December, so, and, and January, uh, so significant decreases in subscribers. Uh, decreases in subscribers, so increases, smaller increases in subscribers. So a lot of people unsubscribing, but more people subscribing. Um, and my conclusion is, is, is basically that I don't really care. So um, I'm not going to be looking that much at subscribers. Uh, 
you know, it's interesting. It's important. Obviously, the more we get, the more audience we have, the better it is. But people are unsubscribing not because of, for the most part, right? Not because of format, not because of uh, style, not because of the camera, the look, the, the, the gen, whatever. People unsubscribe me because of content. They don't like what I've got to say. So they're unsubscribing over Trump, they're unsubscribing over abortion, and they're unsubscribing uh, abortion, Trump, and vaccines. Those are the three issues. And it's, it's, it's amazing. The last day of the year, Action Jackson put up a short video of mine um, on uh, the combined two issues, uh, vaccines and Trump, right? They, they, he put up the short video of this whole controversy about Trump backing the vaccines and the backlash he got from the right and my defense of Big Pharma vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you, you know, what's her name? Um, the, the conservative commentator. Uh, and I got a whole bunch of unsubscribes and a lot of comments in the comment sections about how evil Big Pharma is. I just explained that I think mRNA and CRISPR and biotechnology are the most e exciting technologies that exist today in terms of human progress, in terms of what we're capable, potentially capable of moving into the future here. And they are calling the people who are doing this research, the people who are doing this stuff, and the people who will bring out the cures, the most evil companies in the world. I don't need those people subscribing to my channel. So good riddance. Yes, Candace Owen. I, yeah, I, I, I know I, I need help with names. I apologize. Uh, you know, whatever it is in my brain that does not allow me to retain names and does not allow me to pronounce names correctly is not going to get fixed as I get older. It probably get, gets worse as I get older. Anyway, um, if people don't want to hear what I have to say about vaccines, don't want to hear what I have to say about abortion, don't want to hear what I have to say about Trump, that's fine. I, I'm not going to change the content of the show to appease them. I'm not going to change what I say in order to, I'm not going to soften my touch. I'm not going to ch change what I say in order for them to stay on. They're gone, they're gone. That's fine. So it looks like as I confront more of these controversial issues, as I carve out a niche that is clearly not left and not right, that is pro-reason, pro-science, pro-fact and pro-reality, pro-capitalism, pro-individualism, and pro-egoism, good riddance to the people who are so, uh, so left or right that they can't tolerate to hear an alternative view. They can't tolerate to hear somebody who disagrees with them on a particular concrete. So not focused on subscribers, focused on telling you what I think the truth is. I might be wrong. I might often be wrong. I don't know. I don't think so. Yes, pro-science, the science. There is science. I, I know many people don't want to believe the science. They'd rather believe quack doctors and all kind of quack theories. But, you know, it's worth doing a little bit of research and figuring out what the science actually is. I try to do that. Again, I might be wrong on some issues, but I try to do that. Um, and I try, to, I try to talk to people who know science more than I do to try to get a sense of that. I, you know, I, 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 know, I know enough people, and I think I get it pretty good. Pretty good. All right, let's see. Um, uh, I, I, my, my plans are to do more interviews on the show. I expect to do uh, one every couple of weeks. By the way, on Tuesday, we've got Harry Bing Swinger coming on the show to talk about epistemology, to talk about science, real science, to talk about how you know, how you, how you come to, how you figure out. Um, uh, Param, Param Sunar, thank you. Param says, you earn my subscription by standing for your convictions. I appreciate that, thank you. Those are the people I want, right? You might not agree with me on everything, but you appreciate the fact that I have convictions, that I'm doing my best to figure out what's true and what's not, and uh, I may be wrong in a particular here or there, but 
once I figure out what I think is true, you know, I'm still open to counter evidence, but you have to present evidence. Some more interviews. Um, uh, uh, having been to ANC on Tuesday, we'll talk about free will. We'll talk about epistemology. We'll talk about how you know. I think it'll be fascinating. I'm hoping a lot of you show up live and ask the kind of philosophical, epistemological questions you maybe wanted to ask me, or, or but were afraid I didn't have the answers, or asked me and I didn't give a good enough answer, or you're just interested in. Um, all, all the people out there who are skeptical about free will or whatever, bring on over. So more interviews. I, I'm going to try to do more commentary videos of others, uh, uh, analysis videos of other videos. Um, I, you know, I was like last week I was looking for something to comment on. I, you know, it's hard to find those, those videos that are worthy of a commentary. So I'll, I'll, I've made this offer in the past. I know I haven't always uh, followed up on it, but please send me videos that you would like me to comment on. Send videos and I'll try to comment on them. Uh, more Yuan's rules, one or two a month. Uh, more stuff on art. I I'm also gonna try to end shows with kind of a positive, positive uh, recommendation uh, aesthetic, a positive recommendation of a book, a positive recommendation of something, something positive so that we get uh, more of that. And I'm gonna try to do less politics. I know that'll disappoint many of you, and I know I'm going to lose uh, viewership uh, as a consequence of that. We're going to try to do less positive and try to focus more on positive trends in the culture, science and technology. And then finally, the plan is to do a lot more speaking and debating, uh, but that will depend on people inviting me to come and speak and debate. I need a forum. I need an invitation. So hopefully you, some of you have those forums and have, uh, and have places where I can come and speak. So please invite me. I'm eager to travel around the world and do um, speeches and everything else. Uh, uh, generally, you know, what I hope for 2022 for all of us uh, is that it is, it, that is, it is a year in which we all uh, get to use our reason, get to use our mind, uh, focus on making your life better. This goes to Iran's rules. Uh, focus on... Um, on living the best life that you can in, uh, in 2022. Really take the opportunity again of a new year to make it a new beginning, right? And um, let's live great lives in 2022. That's the most important thing for all of us. All right, let's do super chats as always we'll start with the whoa we'll start with 50 dollars. that's paul's um paul says i'm upping my monthly you are the best most logical of the objectivist commentators out there today thank you paul i really appreciate that uh, and appreciate the supports and i appreciate you upping it and you also do a lot of super chats so thank you for that that combination of super chat and monthly that is terrific um thank you guys all right let's do a bunch of uh uh, of the Super Chat questions, uh, uh, starting with the $20 ones, and then we'll see how many of the smaller ones we get to. Uh, uh, Raphael asks, why you fully agree with Lock why you don't fully agree with the Lockean concept of, of natural rights? I mean, that's a good question to ask Harry Benswing, and when he's here on Tuesday, he will give you a, a better, fuller, I think, philosophical answer to that. I will just say, because because... Rights, in a sense, are not natural. Uh, rights are a conceptual achievement. They're philosophical achievement. They are a discovery, a philosophical discovery. I agree with Locke on that fact that it is discovered, but I disagree with him on the sequence and how he, 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 he puts it all together. Um, it is too, um, too, in a sense, detached from morality and not connected enough with the egoistic, with egoism, with the morality of egoism. And man's uh, basic means of survival being reason. So you can't really blame Locke. It's not that I blame Locke because Locke didn't have Ayn Rand. But once you have Ayn Rand and you have Ayn Rand's full definition and full understanding of where rights come from, and full validation of rights as based on the egoistic morality and the idea of, 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 of rational egoism, of egoism based on reason, 
you don't need, that is, uh, Locke is just wrong, even though he's right on the concept of rights, he's wrong on where they come from, and, and he's not deep enough in terms of defining them and understanding their full context. So not to diminish Locke's achievement, just to say that Ayn Rand has superseded him in terms of understanding of what rights are. So uh, uh, for full explanation of what Rand's view of rights is, um, look at Man's Rights, the essay by Ayn Rand, in both Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and in uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, in both, at the end of the book, there's a section, on, there's an essay called Man's Rights. And compare that to Locke, and you'll see the big difference uh, in, in the reasoning um, leading up to the concept of rights. Alex F. says, doubling donation to UNARI right now. Good luck. Thanks, Alex. And again, appreciate your uh, significant uh, Super Chat support over the last year. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for both the monthly contribution and the Super Chat contributions. Uh, Michael asks, uh, I made the argument that reason is the faculty of our consciousness, which makes us uniquely human. That is true. The person I was debated responded with, empathy is also uniquely human. No other animal has it. Yes, I think that's true. But the question has to be, where does empathy come from? And empathy comes from a particular kinds of consciousness. Empathy is not a, an emotion you're born with. Babies don't have empathy. Empathy comes from a conceptual being who recognizes other human beings as similar to himself, who recognizes the fact that other human beings a value to him, her, because even as a child, you realize other human beings make it possible for me to do all these fun things, all these good things. I couldn't live without them. I couldn't survive without them. So it makes it possible other people, human beings become a value. And therefore, when other human beings are suffering, that is a direct attack on your values. And that's where empathy comes from. So empathy is an emotion that is a consequence of reasoning. It's not a starting point. The problem today is that people hold emotions as starting points, where emotions are consequences, products of thinking, conclusion once comes to, cognitive activity, the activity of the human consciousness that makes us uniquely human. James asks, what are your thoughts on Chicago? <laughs> the city is losing lower income and higher income people. M yeah, makes sense. However, people are not really fleeing the metro area. I want to move to an airport hub. Chicago has strong cons, but also lots of pros. Um, I mean, Chicago is an amazing city. Downtown is beautiful. But look, uh, uh, for me, the cons outweigh the pros. Now, I have to admit that a big con for me with regard to Chicago is weather. The weather in Chicago is awful. It's cold. It's windy. It's, 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 it's unbelievably cold, particularly as we enter into the January, February, March months. It's just, for me, it's unlivable. I can visit, but I couldn't live in that cold. It's so cold. But look, Chicago crime rates are very high, uh, and they're going up. They're not going down, so it's going in the wrong direction. Chicago is one of the worst cities in the country to be in during uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, Chicago uh, is a city uh, that, uh, you know, you're right, is losing lower income people, which means it's going to be more and more difficult to get people to do service jobs, uh, which means that quality of services might decline. Uh, it's also losing high income people. High income people are the people who create jobs, they're the people who, 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 who uh, uh, also populate high-end restaurants and high-end uh, service facilities so, so keep uh, you know keep uh, keep that all in business um, so I, I think those are big disadvantages I, you know uh, it's a great airport hub Chicago is a good airport you can go anywhere from Chicago but again you've got weather to contend with it's not easy although that's true of every hub um, Chicago is, I love the downtown, I love, I, love, I love Chicago in that sense, but I don't know, I, I, I could never see myself living in Chicago, I understand people who love it, you know it's got a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright homes in it, uh, I'm a huge fan of Frank Lloyd Wright, 
Uh, and it's got some amazing architecture. It's got, in, in, in many regards, the architecture in Chicago is more interesting than the architecture in New York, even of skyscrapers. Um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful modern city in many respects, but it's got this horrible management and, 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 and you know, if there were going to be riots, do you really want to be in Chicago? In that sense, if you're looking for an airport hub, uh, uh, Dallas would be much better. Not a lot of riots in, in Dallas. Dallas is a spread out. Uh, it doesn't really have a downtown, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice place to live. Uh, Atlanta is another major hub, uh, which is um, which is probably a, 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 the suburbs of Atlanta, pretty really nice places to live. I wouldn't live in downtown Atlanta, but the suburbs or even Midtown um, are, are really nice places uh, to live. So uh, there's Uptown and Midtown in in uh, in Atlanta that are really nice. All right. Oh, we got another close to $50 question, so we'll jump to that. You're on. I was halfway through the FH a year ago, Fountainhead a year ago. Devoured Atlas Shrugged in summer, and I'm working through nonfiction now. This is my f second annual. Thanks for helping me take life seriously. Absolutely, Scott. Thank you. Thank you for the support, and I'm excited. Um, so I assume you finished the Fountainhead now? So uh, because you say you're halfway a year ago. Finished Atlas Shrug this summer, I take it, and walking through the nonfiction. Fantastic. It's exactly what I want to hear. That is success from my perspective, right? That is success. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Let's see what we have with $20 questions. Uh, yes. James, we did. That was about Chicago. Roland, uh, Happy New Year. Not sure if you talked about your resolutions yet. One thing I suggest is less politics on your show. I find it boring. Uh, yeah, one of my resolutions was less politics on the show. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I'll live up to that resolution. Uh, fact is, those are the shows that get most viewers. So that is what we're going up against. Most people say they don't want politics, but then they, that's what they consume. It, that is true. Um, I have a lot fewer viewership on the non-political shows. Uh, all right, a lot of Super Chat questions coming in. Uh, let's see, more $20. Andrew, uh, Rand wrote that a key characteristic of a hero's was a joy for living. A society with that attitude would have not responded to COVID the way ours did. Absolutely right. How can philosophy cultivate or hinder that attitude? <laughs> well, sure, I mean, uh, a philosophy that tells you that the purpose of life is to sacrifice to others is a philosophy that encourages sacrifice and pain and suffering. Think about the popularity of, 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 um, uh, of um, what's his name? I'm thinking, the, 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 you know, this is how my mind is working or not working these days. I get J.K. Rollins into my head uh, instead of, uh, you know... Um, you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, God, this is ridiculous. Uh, instead of uh, a psychologist friend who, uh, who, who relishes suffering, right? Who thinks the, the, the purpose of life is, or the, 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 the essence of life is suffering. So uh, you get, uh, altruism conditions you to expect suffering, to expect sacrifice, to expect the downfall to expect bad stuff. It doesn't condition you. Yes, Jordan Peterson, Jesus. I, I had the JP. I had, the, I had those the JP in my head, but I couldn't get. So, you know, Jordan Peterson, this is why he's so popular. It's because he feeds off a culture that is not focused, not views as its heroes, a joy for living, but a joy of suffering, or, or not a joy, but an acceptance of suffering. A, 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 we'll live through suffering. We'll, we'll deal with suffering. We'll survive suffering. We'll handle suffering. That is the focus. You know? And so uh, a society like that is, is, therefore, we respond to COVID the way we did. So uh, philosophy conditions that. That's one way in which it conditions. Another way it conditions is 
to be anti-reason, uh, to be, to be pro-generally skepticism, but to be generally anti-reason and therefore anti-science and to, to question and to challenge um, it, everything, not based on reality, not based on evidence, not based on fact, not based on science, but based on politics. So a philosophy that says everything is political, which is the left has advocated for a long time, and now the right has embraced. Everything is political. Art is all political. Science is all political. Everything is fundamentally not about facts, reality, truth, but fundamentally about its political manifestations. And a philosophy that teaches that teaches skepticism about science. It teaches, uh, it, it, it also teaches subservience to authority. Right? So you're skeptical about the science, but you're open to authoritarianism. So, yes, I mean, uh, undercutting reason is, uh, is an opening to the authoritarian. It's an opening to authority. It's an opening for being told what to do. Because what, what am I supposed to do? If I can't trust my reason, if I can't trust science, if I can't trust facts, what am I supposed to do? Well, do what you're told. Whether what you're told is being told by uh, Biden and Fauci and Trump, or whether you're being told by the latest quack doctor who comes up with the latest crazy thesis to justify the political point of view you already have. Okay, more $20 questions. Bree says, is there an objective way of determining future inflation? The experts seem to be guessing based on what they think millions of people will do. I think it's impossible to have uh, uh, a mathematical uh, determined uh, view of inflation, uh, de determined prediction of inflation, not view of inflation, prediction of inflation, because inflation is indeed dependent on what people will do. So uh, inflation is absolutely dependent on how people respond. Inflation is dependent on inflation expectations and what people expect inflation to be. And uh, how people form those expectations and on how different industries, consumers, different people respond to the different actions of the Fed and to the different actions of uh, the central government. And, and of course, how do you predict inflation when if the Fed changes its policies next week, that will determine a different path for inflation. So now all of that is objective. So it's completely objective to say the theory of inflation depends on these parameters. This is what I expect for each one of them. It is a constantly moving target because each one of them changes because people have free will and nothing is determined. And because the Fed could do this, or, the central, or, or Biden could do that, or the Republicans could do this, or c consumers or producers could do these different things, and that's what will result in different paths, inflation taking different paths. So the fact that I can't predict it with certainty does not mean it's not objective. But objective does take into account human behavior, and human behavior significantly affects the path inflation takes in the future. Michael, how come third world countries like Russia give such light prison sentences for heinous crimes like murder? You can be out in five years, whereas during the Soviet Union, you'd be in a gulag for life over the slightest offense. Yeah, but if you murdered, if, if you were in the right position and you murdered the right person, you would get off scot-free um, in the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, your sentence was determined by politics. Uh, I don't know uh, what the sentence is for murder in Russia today. Again, my assumption is if you murder the right person, you'll be sent to the equivalent of the gulags for a long time. But if you are an influential person and you uh, uh, murder a non-influential person, if you murder the right person, you might be out in five years. Uh, I, I think generally countries like Russia don't place a high value in human life. And that's why taking a human life is not as big of a deal, if you will, as it is in a place like the United States. Other things in Russia you might get horrific sentences for. Saying the wrong thing about Putin might get you in jail. Maybe not a life sentence in jail, but might get you in jail for a longer period of time than murdering somebody. 
All right, we'll take this Scott, Scott uh, question, and then we'll go for the uh, lower level questions. Um, it's more than twenty dollars because it's seventeen ninety nine pounds. Uh, Scott says highlights of the show this year was the positive shows on actually living the philosophy. I'll be doing more of those. Your nine eleven show was also incredibly moving and made me get winning the unwinnable war, which was great and blood boiling. Um, fabulous, Scott. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate that, and those are the shows that I think are most important to me. And, um, and uh, I will continue to do more of those shows. As I said, uh, uh, Iran's Rules for Life uh, at least once a month. I'll try to do more on applied philosophy, on applying the ideas, and I'll try to, uh, again, hopefully the, the interviews will be more positive in that uh, and, and along those lines as well. Uh, Ed asks, if Reason had a rebirth, what would some of the milestone we would see along the way? Can you paint some pictures uh, that through reason would excite people about the newly produced culture. Um, yes, I mean, Leonard Peikoff does this, I think, in, in The Dim Hypothesis. He takes four fields of human endeavor, and he says, for rebirth, we would have to see reason, what he calls I integration in, in the context of Dim, but his reason, um, in, in, in these four areas. And... I don't think that these four are exclusive, but these are four big, important ones that have massive cultural weight, massive cultural weight. Uh, so one is education. So you would have to see a real growth in new schools, new educational curriculum, in new educational programs that placed reason at their heart and at their core and at their center. And they were growing and exciting and people sending their kids to these schools and these schools were doing well and successful. Now, you're seeing that. That's exciting. Because today, you know, maybe one of the fastest growing educational platforms in the world today is run by objectivists, higher ground education, where reason is being applied to education. And where from pre-K all the way through high school, you've got new curriculum being developed and ongoingly being developed, new schools being bought, new schools being opened, new investment being placed in existing schools, schools growing, parents sending their kids to these schools, teachers being trained. This is maybe culture-wise the most exciting thing going on today. Uh, other areas in which, you know, there was an objectivist company that put, to, uh, you know, uh, put together science curriculum for schools. And public schools were taking this and using it, all developed by objectivists. So I think we are seeing the beginnings of a real objectivist-led revolution in education. I had Matt Bateman on the show to talk about this uh, last year, and we'll have others from that school on, um, uh, from higher grad education on future shows, because I think, I, I, I can't convey how exciting this is, right? This is super, super, super exciting. So I think one field would be education. Another field would have to be art. You'd have to see the beginnings of a renaissance in art. Good music, good movies, good painting, good sculpture. Not objectivist, not objectivist, not objectivist. Good, good, not just good in the sense of aesthetically good, but romantic, pro-human being, pro-heroic. That would be a second part where you would see reason being applied. Those would be two areas, the others I'll just mention quickly, because uh, we're running out of time, physics, not physics, science. You have to see not just real innovation in science, really new, but people thinking about science from, an, obje from an, um, a, 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 an objectivist epistemological perspective, from a proper epistemological context. 
For example, I'd like to see the Popperian view of scientific method replaced by an objectivist view of the scientific method, at least the beginnings of that, a few prominent scientists using the objectivist epistemology. Those are some of the areas you'd have to see. I mean, technology would be another, and, and something like thoughtful, uh, uh, this uh, Brian, and, Brian uh, Armitage and, and uh, Alex Epstein's uh, new uh, social media platform is a good example of that. If that took off, that would be a huge step in the direction of, of what it would take to, to, to show the culture what was possible. Partially because what the social media platform is doing is educating people. Okay, Jeff asked, do you find it difficult at times to be cordial to the progressive left as the cornerstone of their philosophy is use of force on productive people in the immoral confiscation of their property? Yes, I, I, I find it very difficult to be cordial to the progressive left, but not so much because of the, of, of the confiscation of their property. I am much more interested in people, the way people live. I find the left uh, exacerbating in that they don't care about individual life. And this is why I find it very difficult to be cordial to the right. And this is why you guys get so upset at me because I hate the right and the left so much. Both. Because both don't value the individual. Both are happy to sacrifice the individual. This is not, for me, primarily about economics. This is about you living your life. This is about the pursuit of happiness. Both reject your right, political, but more importantly, moral right, to pursue your happiness, to live your life based on your mind, your values, your standards, your judgment. That, to me, that, to me, is the most important aspect of my resentment and hatred of the left and right today. I'm not sure why objectivist scientific method is so, is, uh, would, would create any question marks in people's minds. Objectivism has a, an epistemological view that is relevant for science and is different than the conventional view in epistemology. And therefore, there is an objectivist scientific method, a scientific method that comes out of the objectivist epistemology. Objectivism is not a political theory. Objectivism is not, and uh, the scientific method is something that evolves in, in terms of our understanding of epistemology. And, you know, people can do the scientific method without understanding what it is exactly. Uh, people do epistemology all the time without knowing what it is. So absolutely, there is an objectivist scientific method. There's an objectivist view of the scientific method, which is unique and I think would be liberating for scientists and would, would make scientists, scientists far more productive than they are today. Now, that's a whole show. I might ask Harry about that about an objectivist, uh, that would be a good super chat question to ask Harry Binswing. I, I, I'm curious what he thinks about this idea of an objectivist scientific method. All right, let's run through uh, non $20 questions quickly and no more super chats because we're at 900 bucks so we've achieved our goal and more so thank you for everybody who's done super chat. You guys have been great, really appreciate this. I'm gonna do these quickly so I apologize but uh, we are getting close to two hours, and I do have a, a dinner date that I have to get to. Um, Yash asks, will, be, will you be reviewing the movie Don't Look Up? I have mixed feelings about it. False dichotomy of being pro-science versus pro-capitalism, profit motive. Uh, I don't know about Don't Look Up. Uh, so, uh, but of course, if you uh, pay me to do the review, I will definitely do the review. I'm still behind on movie reviews, so... Uh, I, I apologize for that, but I, I will be catching up in the next few weeks in terms of movie reviews. Um, don't look up. I, I don't know the movie. I'll look at it. Uh, Michael asks, is the world moving away from socialism and towards fascism in a sick way? Is that a minor improvement? No, it's not a minor improvement, and yes, it is moving uh, more towards fascism. Um, uh, socialism in the form of the Soviet Union failed. Uh, fascism 
is is more attractive to the powers to be. They have to take on less responsibility because they don't own the means of production. It's easier to fool us into thinking we still have private property. So it's easier, I think, to take a mixed economy towards fascism than it is towards socialism. Hey, what are your thoughts on us India and US India relations? Not much is said on the topic uh, from your biggest fan, Param. I mean, I think generally India is an ally globally for the, of the United States. It is a relatively, relatively, again, emphasizing free country. Um, it, it has an important border with China. Uh, it, it has, uh, you know, it will be the most populated country in the world uh, soon. Uh, it, even though uh, birth rates in India have dropped dramatically, they're down to uh, almost replacement levels, but China is going to start shrinking population-wise. India is stable population-wise, still increasing, but is going to stabilize soon. Um, uh, India is has incredibly, incredible productive capacity. Unfortunately, India is, is, has uh, flirts with nationalism, flirts with uh, restrictions on capitalism, flirts with, uh, you know, not embracing more capitalism. It was a period where it was moving towards more and more liberalization, more and more capitalist policies. That seems to have stopped. I'd like to see India become freer. But I think it's really, really important that the United States have good relations with India and promote uh, increased trade with India, increased immigration from India, and increased... Um, increased freedom in India to the extent that the United States has any sway with regard to freedom anymore. Uh, Michael asks, are you going to buy the new Tesla iPhone? What do you think of Tesla buying Mercedes? Are you still sure we should be selling Tesla stock? Uh, you know, I sh I, yes, I think you should be selling Tesla stock for what it's worth. I, you know, yeah, if you'd listened to me when I said sell Tesla stock, you would have missed out on a big opportunity. So I guess don't listen to me, but I, I don't own Tesla stock and wouldn't own Tesla stock if, 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 I, if I could. So I'm not, I'm not buying it. I'm not shorting it either, but I'm not buying it. Um, so uh, uh, what do I, will I buy the new Tesla iPhone? No. What do you think of Tesla buying Mercedes? Doubtful. I don't think Tesla has any incentive to buy Mercedes. Why would they? What for? There's no value added, I don't think. Tesla has a brand. It has a name. Uh, it doesn't need Mercedes-Benz. It adds nothing to it. It now has productive capabilities in Europe, in China, in, in the United States. It, it, it doesn't need Mercedes or anybody else. Uh, do you like the German group Rumstein? I don't know the German group Rumstein. Uh, JJ Jigso, wokeism will die. Most people hate it. I, I think so. I think that's right. As an objectivist, do you, but it will morph into something else, right? The ideas behind behind it won't die because, um, because they have a, a strong intellectual foundation at our universities. As an objectivist, do you see growth in the past decade or so in the general libertarian movement, those who identify with in, as libertarian as a positive or negative force? I don't know that there's been growth in the libertarian movement over the last decade. I, I, I don't know that there has been because I, I think Trump... Um, so many people who were libertarian turned into Trumpists. So I, I think that the whole Trump phenomena, the, the, the populist phenomena, the, 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 the national, nationalist phenomena has siphoned up a lot of people from what used to be libertarian-leaning people have turned into statists, statists of the right, but statists. So I don't know. But generally, I don't think the growth of libertarianism is a positive phenomenon. I don't think that. I think the growth of people who believe in free markets is a positive phenomenon. But to the extent that they embrace an, uh, 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 ANCAP or to the extent that they embrace the subjectivism uh, of libertarianism or the foreign policy of libertarianism, I don't think it's a positive. Um, let me see. Oh, we got an Australian question at $20. I'm Australian and just found Ayn Rand. Cool. Excellent. I'm a business person. I have trouble with getting over making a big profit. <laughs> you should celebrate making a big profit. It is a, you should be proud of making a big profit. I know it sounds silly. I don't think it's silly. I think that's what we grow up on. That's everything. 
you should listen to the Iran Book Show where I defend profit and I will have shows on the virtues of profit. Uh, and particularly, Iran's Rules for Life are shows you should listen to. You should go back and, and pick up some of those shows. And my shows on the virtues, there's a, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole uh, uh, playlist of those shows which I think you'd enjoy. Uh, I know, uh, where should I start to get a positive about make, uh, making a big profit? Um, capitalism, not known ideal by Ayn Rand. Um, you know, you could, you should also read, uh, well, you should read Ayn Rand generally, but for, on this issue, uh, my two books are pretty good. I think uh, 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 Free Market Revolution and Equal is Unfair both deal with the issue of profit, both e deal with the morality of profit. So Equal is Unfair and uh, Free Market Revolution, you can get them both on Amazon. Uh, but uh, you can, um, but read Ayn Rand, and, and again, listen to my past shows where I discuss the virtues, where I discuss uh, rules for life, and where I discuss uh, uh, profit. So look at the titles, and there'll be, there'll be shows where those are discussed, and keep listening, because I'll definitely cover those topics, I'll cover the topic of profits over and over and over again, but those, those, uh, those books will, will cover all of that. Uh, there's nothing I say that is not covered by Ayn Rand in her nonfiction somewhere. Okay, Michael says, Ayn Rand is considered a quack by 95% of philosophers. Truth is not popularity contest. I know. <laughs> uh, Fang says, why did Hitler need to do a dictatorship? He had many opportunities to turn Germany around. All he really had to do was just get Germans back to work because his purpose was not to turn Germany around. His purpose was to be a dictatorship. His purpose was to go to war. His purpose was destruction. His purpose was murder. His purpose was annihilation. And the whole point was that Germany should rule Europe. It wasn't just for Germany to do well. Don't attribute any positive motivation to Hitler. He had none. William says, thanks to you, Yaron. Happy New Year. Stay the radical you are. I'm not a radical, but I do take the best cuts out of the objectivism and your intellectual point of view on life, love, and economics. Thank you, William. Hopefully, over time, we'll make you a radical. Cook, uh, I really enjoy thoughtful, Thoughtful's uh, recommendation feature. So Thoughtful's is the name of the social, um, uh, social app that... Uh, that Alex Epstein uh, has, uh, has released. A thought fools, look for that. JJ uh, Jigis, can't pronounce that. Yohan, you haven't told me to clean my room yet. It's totally a mess now. Food and dirty laundry everywhere. When is that Wolf of Life show coming? Please hurry. You're gonna have to wait. It's, it's not in the top 12 or so that I've already done. Uh, do you think Ronald Reagan and Margaret Chatter bought us 50 years, Michael asks? Yeah. I mean, I don't think they bought it. I think the people who laid the foundations for them bought us. I think it's Ayn Rand and Hayek and von Mises and Milton Friedman bought it to 50 years. But yes, 50 years were bought. Gene asks, 2020 suggestions, 2022 suggestions. I'd like to see super chats on screen as you're answering them. They are a big part of the show and would be a cool to highlight. It also helps to find segments if not watching live. Well, you can look for them not live because they stream with the show. Uh, so if you have them, you, you, can, you can do that when you're not watching live. I'll have to think about how to put them on screen. But of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see all of that happening as it happens. So I'm not sure why having them on screen is an advantage. Ali says, I had a couple of questions regarding regulations and objectivism. Should regulation elimination in totality, what about chaos in housing zones, roads? I'm going to postpone this one, Ali. Um, the answer is basically yes, you should deregulate in totality. Something would replace regulations and, and how this, uh, you know, the certain laws that would still be in place for certain things, but regulations, qual regulations would have to go. Uh, but I'll have to give you a lot more co con concrete, but we'll do that on a future show. 
Thanks, everybody. Wow, we, we reached $900. That was a lot more than I expected, over $900, 923 A lot more than I expected after, uh, you know, the, the, the amazing day we had uh, yesterday. Um, so thank you. Uh, next show is tomorrow. Not yesterday, the day before yesterday. Next show is tomorrow. I, I'm not sure about, about the topic, but next show is tomorrow, 2 p.m. East Coast time. I'll see you all tomorrow. Don't forget to become monthly subscribers. Don't forget to support the show in whatever way you can. Patreon, subscribe store, or your runbookshow.com slash support. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Super Chatters. Happy New Year. I'll see you on the second show of the year on Sunday, tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Bye, everybody.